Maori history, Life Before Europeans, is today, by and large, being portrayed like a book and the movie, Watership Down, romantic engagement by the people of the land, with nature, the cosmos, even idyllic carefree lives, that were completely snuffed out when the white blokes and big large ships began arriving, evil colonists bent on stamping out customs, like eating your fellow man, enslaving them and killing your baby because it wasn't a male. Modern Maori history is the equivalent of reading a redacted document, large waves are blanked out rectangles. On the shelves of my central library are dozens of large toms, meticulously cataloguing iwi or tribal history, lineages. Hardly a paragraph is spared though about the time a great-great-great-grandfather partook in eating his neighbours or ended up as the main course himself, nor the little matter of your great-great-great-aunt being snuffed out aged two days. Moreover, the little bits we think we know is the case regarding cannibalism are now systematically being rewritten and watered down. I am about to bring some sobering clarity to this practice because there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of first-hand testimonies from horrified witnesses about what went on. Everybody knows, of course, cannibalism went on. Broadly though, only on a macro perspective, in general, not the specifics, the messy micro bit. Let's start with the number one widespread present day belief people have on this touchy subject. That's Maori cannibalism only occurred after battle, eating the vanquished and in the ultimate degradation, excreting them. Whilst true, this did happen, cannibalism wasn't just a ritualistic byproduct of conflicts alone. Consuming slaves was by far number one. Some of those were prisoners but they may have been in servitude for years before being dispatched. An estimated 10% of people living in New Zealand in 1825 were, after all, slaves. These untermenschen were killed and eaten regularly. A celebration for a newly constructed meeting house and waka, war canoes, would be rounded off with a feast of slave flesh. You could get killed and cooked for slighting someone's mana, that's pride for overseas listeners, not showing respect, straying onto the wrong path. Augustus Earl, who you will hear from more later on, was mortified to learn the corpse that was being eaten in front of him, the bones of which the dogs were fighting over, were that of a boy he'd been friendly with. His crime, forgetting to tender the village garden, that's yet another watered-down modern rewrite, being it was only fighting-age men who were cooked up. Rubbish, para, that's the merry word for rubbish. The only meat on the menu wasn't just adult men, women and children too. Children's flesh was particularly savoured. White men's, less so. No one was spared. The only exemption was a relative. After giving this podcast a listen, I'm fairly sure you'll agree with my assessment that it's an extremely long bow to draw, highly selective, to suggest a whanau or family violence only became prevalent after Europeans arrived when killing and eating children went on. For the record, more often than not, it was the men who did the noshing. As you will hear shortly, often it was an arbitrary practice, little more than senseless brutality. One report I read was an intervillage dispute over an ownership of a dog that ended up in an aggrieved party and the family getting dispatched and eaten. Another, in what is probably best termed massacre, was predicated on the sky being red, indicating it was time to wreak death upon the neighbouring tribe. Eat them, all of them, excepting the child-bearing age woman and toddlers. A sure way to rid yourself of a curse back then was to kill and eat the perpetrator. Getting life insurance in New Zealand two centuries ago wasn't an easy thing. This custom of eat thy neighbour took a good seven decades to finally be extinguished, thanks chiefly to Christian missionaries. Not that there were here many people today applaud their efforts on this front. What you're about to hear are warts and all reports from the time. 
As best I can, I will give you broad details of the writer, date and location, etc. So you can look for a book yourself in the library. In the same section, you are bound to find a range of other books or of a similar vein. Other recommendations, you can place them in the comment section of YouTube. I'm hardly being selective here. This podcast would run for hours if I read them all out. Writers back then weren't bound by modern constructs like political correctness or cultural relativity. What they saw is what you get. Before I kick off, listener warning. It's a disturbing picture. Most listeners will be sickened enough from these examples. I'm pleased I went no further with more harrowing stories from the first Europeans. For the poke holes in anything of people who need to get out more, I have anglicised and modernised wording to make it more listenable. Into it, excerpt 1. William Yate, a missionary who along with William Williams was one of the first people to put the Maori language into writing. His book set here in 1831-32 is called An Account from New Zealand. What Yates didn't include in the book was he was a raving poofter, got caught touching up the natives and booted out of the country and the Church of England. Cruelty and the desire to inflict pain mark all the proceedings of the New Zealand battle. The blood of the victim is slowly drained from the most sensitive parts of the body and not too unfrequently quaffed to slack the thirst or to gratify the revenge of the conqueror. The almost unified conclusion to these bloody scenes is the lamenting over the dead bodies of their friends, cutting off heads of their enemies and preparing the bodies for a feast. As with very few exceptions, they eat the bodies of the chiefs whom they have slain. I cannot ever think that from any desire that this generality of them having to satisfy their own appetite for human flesh, but from a diabolical spirit of revenge. Our second author is Edward Tregear, and his book is called The Maori Race. Tregear was sympathetic towards the plight of Maori. Indeed, for that matter, any downtrodden person in society, he wanted to bring the end of the English class system and capitalism as a whole. He lived amongst Maori and suggested Maori were part of a mythical Aryan race. Here we go. The prisoners are taken in the fight, and they were slain in cold blood, except for those reserved for slavery, a mark of a still greater contempt than being actually killed for food. Sometimes after the battle, a few of the defeated were thrust alive into large food baskets, and thus further degraded forever. As a general rule, however, they were slain for the oven. In days near our own, it is recorded that the chief of Tifero Fero ordered 250 prisoners of the Taranaki people to be brought to him for slaughter. He sat on the ground, and as the prisoners were brought one by one to receive a blow from the chief's merry club, after he had killed 250, he said, I am tired, let the rest live, and the remainder passed into slavery. This next passage is taken from The Pioneer Days of the Southern Maryland by M.A. Rugby Pratt. That's right, Rugby Pratt, a Methodist Bible banger and campaigner against the demon drink. As a new day glimmered on the dying and the dead amid the scene of desolation, preparations were made to cook the bodies of the slain. What flesh could not be consumed was packed in or about 100 baskets and taken to Kapiti that the horrible feast might be continued there. On the way to Kapiti, the captive chief and his wife strangled their little daughter, lest she should become a slave or wife of one of their treacherous captors. Most of the prisoners of the war were slain and a few were enslaved. Around the neck of the chief was hung the head of his son, whose body had been consumed before his eyes. He himself was taken from the pa to pa and made the object of derision by his captors and was afterwards killed with a spear thrust by a widow of one of the warriors who with fiendish satisfaction drank his warm blood as it gushed from the wound. The bodies of the chief and his wife were afterwards eaten, the eyes of the fallen chief being swallowed whole to prevent them, as the native feared, becoming fixed in a sterile firmament. 
onwards, respected today by modern day scholars for his cataloguing of Maori customs, a massive chronicler of life in New Zealand in the early to mid 1800s, writing six full volumes. White even ran a newspaper published every week in Te Reo. The party who took the part stayed in it, and keeping all the women they could and killed all the men. The children under three years, they cut their heads and arms off and cooked the trunk, taking the insides and then beating them into a pulp, which they said was the best type of food to eat, with ferns. The women, they ran sharp sticks through their feet to prevent them escaping. A man had intercourse with one of them, and then after the act, he killed her. More from John White, a rather interesting chap actually. He wrote the first book on Maori poetry, and being a bit of a music nut, he liked to put Maori songs to English or European tunes, and he also wrote a book on Maori mythology. As I sat intently watching the people of our camp, my slave came up to me and said, Some of our people have caught a man, and they're preparing him for the oven. I ran off to see who it was. On the way, I was speaking to a red-haired girl who'd been caught out in the open. We were then in just on the eastern side of Mount Eden. This girl had been caught at the stream. My companions remained with the girl while I went down to see the other men from the Waikato who had been killed. When I arrived, they were preparing the flesh. The bones were to be put to other purposes. One of the men engaged on the bones was working on a kneecap. I asked, what are you doing? I was told the kneecap is for a pipe. The man was killed in revenge and his leg bones will be now made into flutes. As we came back, I saw the head of the red-haired girl lying in the ferns by the side of the track, and further on, we overtook one of the men, and he was carrying a backload of her flesh, which was taken to our camp to cook for food. The arms of the girl were around his neck, whilst the body was on his back. We go to this penning by the captain of the vessel, HMS Dromedary. Richard A. Cruz, and it comes from his book from 1823 entitled Journal of Ten Months in New Zealand. A female slave belonging to one of the chiefs, whom he had ill-treated, was said in bitterness of her heart to have cursed him, a crime in that race that they never forgive. And when she was standing on the beach, opposite to the European houses, he walked up to her and with a blow of his club, his Mary, laid her dead at his feet. There was a pool of fresh water close to the house of Mr. King, a missionary, to which the body was immediately carried. The entrails were taken out. It was divided into three quarters and washed perfectly clean. The chief then threw it into a canoe, and with some of his tribe crossed over to the neighbouring island to devour it. This horrible act was perpetrated in the presence of some missionaries. Daniel Sheridan was an entrepreneurial trader who traipsed between both sides of the fence. He had the trust of both the English and Mary. The principal part of the prisoners that day were cripples, women and children. The remainder making their escape as well as the weak state would allow. A party of the enemy were employed in dispatching as many would be sufficient for the evening's meal. Their slaves getting the ovens ready and the remainder went in search of more prey which they found to a great number of 1,200. On the 23rd they commenced the slaughter of the prisoners that were taken alive. They were crammed into huts, well guarded, and the principal chief executioner, with a sharp tomahawk in hand, was there ready to receive them. They were called out one by one. Those that had tattooed heads had their heads cut off and put on a block, the body quartered and hung upon fences that were erected for the purpose. Those with indifferent heads received one blow and were then dragged to the hole to bleed. The young children and grown up lads were cut down the belly and roasted on sticks before the fires. This one comes from a global traveller, Joel Samuel Pollock, with one L, a Jewish trader who once again walked the fine line between Maori and European. 
encouraged Mary to be more entrepreneurial, break away from the finite resource that was trading in shrunken heads, get into other products like carving, which of course he would sell, major, and I mean really major, claim to fame. Pollock started New Zealand's first beer brewery, arguably pushes his credibility way above those of the missionaries. His books on life in New Zealand were very well read, this snippet, likely 1833 or 1834, is an anecdotal one. It comes from a fellow trader, Anskar. Anskar had not been long seated when an interesting slave girl appeared, apparently about 15 years of age and remarkably handsome. Her approach was no sooner discovered than an old, decrepit chief woman hobbled forth from her hut, made us the subject of the most vehement language towards the girl who had appeared to have absented her without leave for two days. The old crone had vented forth her tirade, which was unable to continue to total exhaustion, when she turned to a ferocious fellow next door, who was standing by her, and desired him to kill the girl immediately. The ruffian did not wait for repetition of the request, but ran to a boat, and seizing one of their tomahawks, which he had brought for barter, he struck the miserable girl a blow in the forehead with the implement that cut her head in two. The body was then decollated and opened, and the entrails washed and placed in a basket. Attending these circumstances was horrible and disgusting of the scene. The head was thrown to the children as a plaything, and then the little miscreants rolled it to and fro like a ball, thrusting small sticks up its nose and the mouth and ears, and later scooped out the eyes. The remnants in several pieces were then put into baskets and taken to the river to be cleaned from the filth they had received by being mangled on the ground. The ovens were heated, some vegetables scraped. The whole thing was cooked in an hour. A large party partook of the body. Ainge Carr was in a state of instant agony during these proceedings and felt fearful for his own life. Some of the body was presented to him in a small basket and he was derided for refusing to eat it. Last up, a paragraph from Augustus Earle. That name may not be familiar to you. The oil and watercolour paintings he did of early New Zealand will be. His talents were on such demand, Earl ended up accompanying Charles Darwin on the Beagle, not because he was a particularly great artist, more his ability to whip up three paintings to the normal painter's one. The captain he mentions in this is Richard Duke, and he is the captain of the vessel, it's a whaling vessel, the Sisters. On the spot of the rising ground, just outside the village, we saw a man preparing a native oven, which is done in the following simple manner. A hole is made in the ground, and hot stones are put within it, and is all covered up close. As we approach, we saw evident signs of the murder which had been perpetrated, and bloody mats were strewn around, and a boy was standing by them, actually laughing put his finger to his head and then pointed towards the bush. I approached the bush and there I discovered a human head. My feelings of horror may be imagined as I recognise the features of the unfortunate girl. I had even seen her in the village the preceding evening. We ran towards the fire and there stood a man occupied in a way few would wish to see. He was preparing the four quarters of a human body for a feast. The large bones haven't been taken out, they were thrown aside, and the fresh compressed. He was in the act of forcing it into the oven. While we stood transfixed by this terrible sight, a large dog, which lay before the fire, rose up, seized the bloody head, and walked away with it into the bushes, no doubt to hide it for another meal. The man completed his task with the utmost of perfect composure, telling us, rather disappointingly, it would take some time for the body to be ready. Pew, and that's it. I was tempted to say had a guts full, but it's probably not the best choice of words. And as this isn't enough blood and gore for one day, your morbid curiosity appeared. A couple of years ago, I did a video on interesting things about Doimoka. Marry a shrunken heads. Get your pen and pad ready for that one. And there's instructions in that video. Viewer feedback is that it's easier 
than assembling IKEA. Link to the video is in the description of this podcast. I do trust this was an enlightening and interesting episode. You will come back for another serving. I save the eyes, especially for you. Bye for now.